It's April 15th, 2017. My name is Jim Simpson. And this is kind of a continuation of the video from yesterday on how to buy a new truck and have lemon law type of protections, uh, either by flying to Wisconsin and buying a truck there or threatening to and getting lemon law type of protections contractually out of your local truck dealer um, of a brand new truck of any make, model, description uh, anywhere in the country. And obviously the closer you are to Wisconsin, the more credible the threat is. But even if you're in I don't know, northern Florida or Maine or whatever, you can still hop on a plane to Wisconsin. And I'll bet you was a Milwaukee truck dealer would pick you up at the airport and get you on your way. Um, so it's a credible threat wherever you are in the country if you go to make uh, a contractual change with your truck dealer in Arizona or whatever. So... This is kind of a continuation of that discussion. We're going to talk about uh, what truck to buy for different purposes and different price ranges and different levels of acceptable risk. Part of what all this is about. As you heard from yesterday's conversation, you can get risk even with a brand new truck. And yesterday's discussion was all about trying to minimize that risk. Well, now we're going to talk about how to minimize or at least understand the risk when buying older, cheaper trucks or various new trucks today um, for different needs. Now, we're gonna make some assumptions here. You're an individual owner operator to be. You're buying a truck for yourself as the driver. Um, you are buying a truck to do 80,000 pound trucking. In other words, uh, normal, not heavy load truck, not oversized heavy haul. Uh, you're probably doing dry van or reefer. Maybe you're doing flatbed. But uh, you, you're doing general freight, you want the best fuel economy you can possibly get. Um, I'm going to gear this entire conversation to that subject. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see me stray from that and, and get off the side of that just a little bit. But for the most part, that's the kind of truck that I'm looking to purchase eventually. It's where my interests have lied and where I've gathered the most information and hopefully I can be of some use in this big data dump. Now, yesterday on Reddit, somebody commented on, the vi on yesterday's video of 16 minutes that, sorry man, couldn't make it first past the first uh, three minutes. So as we're approaching the three minute mark, we will have a uh, celebrity guest appearance by Steve Irwin from the time that he tried being a trucker. And Steve Irwin here. Today we're going to talk about that rare reptile, the North American lot lizard. Now these are dangerous, dangerous creatures made of crocky. We're not quite sure how they reproduce, but we think it's got something to do with methamphetamines and make it a block stick fall off. So mate, whatever you do, don't stick your dick in a lot lizard. Ah, oh, crocky. They're worse than stingrays. Okay, so in the next, I don't know how long this conversation is going to run, but it could be half hour, it could be an hour. I'm driving the next two hours through rural northern Pennsylvania, boring as heck. Um, I'll probably throw another celebrity guest appearance in somewhere in there, in there to spice things up. So let's get to it. If you under, want to understand the pros and cons of the various trucks, um, first thing to understand is that asking, or should I buy Volvo, or should I buy Freightliner, or should I buy International, is a very complicated question. And it depends on what era you're talking about and what you want out of the truck. One of the weirder things is that if you compare, for example, 2005 Freightliner with a 2005 International, they're going to be much more similar to each other, one Freightliner, one International, than a 2005 Freightliner with a 2017 Freightliner there will be enough major, major, major changes between 2005-2017 that we might as well not call those two Freightliners, those two eras, both Freightliners. They are, obviously, and they get... But the, about the only point of similarity, really, is they both get serviced by the same dealer network, um, which can be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on which manufacturer you're talking about. Okay, so to understand what you get or tend to get in the different eras, you have to start with one of my favorite subjects, the law. Um, laws over time, especially smog laws, but also the electronic logging device laws, 
affect the discussion of what each era of truck will generally do. So let's start with that, okay? Because I'm assuming that you're in the general freight market, I'm assuming you're gonna want decent aerodynamics. So you're not looking at the big long nose, flat nose, Texas bumper that big flat sheet of chrome that looks like it came off of a buffet table. Um, you're not looking at that kind of big chrome monstrosity. Uh, you know the trucks I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about. I'm assuming that that's not what you're shopping for. If you are shopping for something like that, it's either because you love the way they look, that's really not a good reason guys, honestly it's not, or you have a good guaranteed stream of mileage that pays really well, three bucks a mile or more, and you don't care about fuel, and that big chrome look is mm, for you. Um, or you're doing something like heavy haul where you're only going 45 or 55 miles an hour all day anyway aerodynamics doesn't matter and the ability to get in and service a really big motor under that big long hood is important in which case if that's your thing go for it but what i'm going to focus on is the aerodynamic trucks the streamliner trucks the corporate look trucks and those start in 1986 with the kenworth t600 that was the truck that was derisively named the Aardvark by truckers. Uh, they said it looked funny because it had a slope nose and, you know, the first attempt at a streamlined truck. And I think a lot of people realized it was a harbinger of things to come because by 98 to 2000 range, every manufacturer, Volvo, Freightliner, International, even Mac, I believe, uh, all these guys, Kenworth, they all had streamlined looking, corporate looking, somewhat modern looking trucks um, the other big change that happens between 86 and say 2000 is the introduction of the first generation of electronically controlled motors so you see the Detroit diesel series 60 motors with electronic controls uh, and by that I mean the um, equivalent to a throttle position on these diesels is the, at the fuel pump and how the fuel injectors work and that's all mechanically controlled instead of electronically digitally controlled in my opinion you want an electronically controlled engine even the first generation like the detroit series 60 was a good motor the cat 3406 e e for electronic fantastic motor 15 liter class uh, the detroit series 60 was divided into the 12.7 liter which is a gem of a motor 13 liter class one of the best fuel economy motors of its era. Uh, Cat had the 3406E at first, and Cummins had the N14. N14 is a good motor too, 14 liter engine. Uh, the Red Top was their, the best of the N14s. Uh, higher horsepower, and in many cases, better fuel economy as well. Um, when they say Red Top, by the way, that's either a homage to Ferrari or a parody, because the Ferrari Testarossa uh, Testarossa in Italian means redhead, and if you open up the hood of a Testarossa, or wherever that is, I forget, uh, the heads on the motor were red, and that told you, whoa, that's the head. that's the serious motor. So Cummins parodied that. Honda did the same thing too. They started painting valve covers bright red. Open the hood, ooh, ah, wonderful. So uh, that was a fad for a while there, and the fact that it made its way to trucks, I think, is hilarious. Um, Cat, by just after 2000, I believe, came out with the C12 and C13 sized motors, 12 and 13 liter motors, which were also very nice. Um, they had a slightly, well, I want to say worse reputation for reliability, but the Detroits had the best reputation for reliability at that time. Uh, but the cats were not bad. I wouldn't turn my nose up at a good rebuilt Cat C12, Cat C13. The other motor out there was, um, starting around that time, was Volvo had their own house brand motor. The D12, up through up into 2007, was a wonderful motor. Uh, D12, I can't say enough good things about it. Uh, best motor Volvo's ever built. Um, You'll often see a Volvo that's got a Cummins motor or a Detroit diesel motor in it. 
Detroit Diesel is actually part of the same chain of companies as Mercedes, Freightliner, Sterling, and Western Star. So in a Freightliner or Western Star or Sterling, the house brand motor is going to be a Detroit. Um, but you'll sometimes see those with cat motors uh, or Cummins sometimes. Mostly you see a Freightliner is going to mostly have a Detroit diesel motor in it. Uh, Volvo, same way. It's mostly going to have a Volvo motor, but it might have a Detroit or something else. Um, International uh, didn't really have their own house brand motors until, uh, I believe, 2008, but don't quote me. I'll have to I'll figure out where the Max Force comes in. Um, but for a long time, every International you find of the uh, 2000 to 2007 era is going to have a Detroit or a Cummins or a Cat, something like that in it. Um, what else? You'll notice I've been talking about 12 liter, 13 liter, or 12.7, might as well be 13, 14s and 15s. Of those sizes, the best fuel economy is in the 12 to 13 liter range. Um, but a good 15 liter, 14 or 15 liter motor can also do pretty good fuel economy um, if everything else is right. You'll have about an 800 pound weight deficit over the smaller engines. Um, my preference of motors before 2007, and we'll get into why that year is crucial in a minute, um, I believe the best of the breed was the Detroit 12.7 Series 60. Uh, sweetheart of a motor. I drove one of those for seven months, uh, made it to a 13-speed tranny. Wonderful combination. And tough as nails, easy to get it worked on anywhere. Um, a lot of parts still made, etc. You get into the, the older generation of, me of mechanical series motors, the Cummins big cams, your Cat 3406B, which is still a mechanical control engine, the people around who still know how to tune those old mechanical control motors are dying out or at least retiring and things like that. So it, it's just hard to find people to work on them. Um, somebody's able to flame me like hell for this, but I would say stick with at least an electronic control motor. Now, let's talk about laws. So all, this is, is all this interacts. In 2002, the first set of smog laws hit. That's exhaust gas recirculation, EGR. Um, EGR didn't do too much damage to the trucks, um, especially by 2004 or so. All the manufacturers had figured out how to live with it, and even the older ones, um, there were some retrofit kits that are going to be done to pretty much any of the trucks out there that retains the EGR, uh, but makes it livable. Software updates in some cases to the engine management computer. Um, I would not turn my nose down at a, or up or in any direction, at a truck that had EGR. The other thing though that you quote unquote gain with the 2002 spec motors is the ability to run electronic logs because now there's a standardized data port 2002 and forward that your um, electronic logger can plug into and detect uh, engine RPMs and movement and a few other things. Um, before that, you had some electronic control motors, but they didn't have the standard plug for electronic logs. So you cannot run electronic logs on a 2001 or older motor. There are people who are specifically looking for 2001 and older trucks and some evidence that they're going up in price a little bit because some people hate e-logs. And buying one of those trucks and owning it and running it is one way to absolutely ensure that you won't be stuck with e-logs. And there's people thinking that way. Um, something to consider. Uh, I will say this, e-logs, to me, I'm now in a company, smaller outfit, or I'm running paper logs. Actually, I run an electronic legal equivalent to paper. But um, let's just say I don't run dirty at all. I don't run outlaw. But you do have a little more flexibility on where you can park next to the shipper. I mean, the log doesn't even turn on in five minutes. So if you park five miles away from your shipper and cruise in there in the morning, you don't have to turn your, you start your 14-hour clock right away. And sometimes that'll save you 
a lot of pain, financial and otherwise. Uh, so it gives you the extra flexibility of being the difference between spending all night out in front of a shipper with no bathroom facility available or being a human being and spending it in at least a truck stop parking lot where there is a bathroom if you have to drop a load that does not require uh, written paperwork if you know what I mean I think you do okay enough said on that um, if you want to avoid paper logs you go 2001 or earlier the 2002 into 2007 trucks are still good trucks in terms of avoiding most of the later problems that arose out of smog controls now 2007 new set of smog laws hit federally that require new trucks to be sold that have DPF diesel particulate filters on board and this was really more of a cosmetic change than anything else that black soot that some of the older trucks would sometimes kick out of the pipe up top or down below sometimes really wasn't that damaging to the environment because it settles out of the air very quickly lands in the ground and it's dust it's not that toxic um, but somebody decided oh we got to clean that up so we'll put a great big filter in the exhaust well uh, that filter tends to clog up to unclog it on the road what they do is deliberately overheat that exhaust to burn that filter out that's called regeneration and if the regeneration cycles start to fail uh, you can get all kinds of problems the worst case scenario is the exhaust system backs up and um, puts holes in the exhaust system between the turbo and the filter which is now clogged up and you're now leaking carbon monoxide into the truck nice real nice guys uh, that actually happened to me in a 2014 uh, Kenworth with a Packard motor we'll get into that later so a lot of people want to avoid that whole diesel particulate nightmare uh, one thing some people do is just put a bypass pipe in and pull that filter out you get caught doing that it's a ten thousand dollar fine it's not points in your record but it's a big pain and i just do not recommend messing with that now of the early smog motors the early dpf motors around 2007 8 9 it appears that detroit diesel was the most successful of those engines with the least amount of problems from them especially if you uh occasionally cook that filter or literally put it in an oven and a special oven especially made for this purpose not the one in your kitchen but you go to a place that knows how to take that filter out cook it burn all the ashes out and they do this every quarter million miles or so depending on the manufacturer um, properly cleaning out the, the filter on its regular schedule it's like generally about a quarter million miles uh, you can live with those trucks um, from what I've heard a lot of the others were problematic the early Volvos with smog controls um, Volvo let's take Volvo for example they went from the d12 motor before DPF hit to the d13 motor after and the Volvo d13 from 2007 uh, with DPF until about 2012 was when they finally figured out how to make it work right between those years it was a disaster um, so if I'm buying pre 2010 probably honestly 2011 or earlier but 2007 after uh, I probably want to go Freightliner because but by then they weren't selling hardly any Detroit diesel motors to anybody but themselves so that means Freightliner or Western Star if you want the luxury class uh, version of a Freightliner it's called a Western Star that's how it is uh, the, and by the way the poverty version of a Freightliner would be Sterling that's the third truck in that group um, Sterling would be like a low grade but some of them a high spec Sterling is really not much different in some years than a low spec Freightliner 
hardly any difference to speak of. And because Sterling has the reputation of being the low rent version of that family, sometimes you can find one at a good deal. So if you find a Sterling that matches your needs, uh, don't turn your nose up on it. It's, it's no worse than a Freightliner of that era. Um, okay, what else? Um, the biggest, the company that had the most problems with smog laws, by the way, I said that they tightened up in 2007 and required the diesel particulate filter. Well, in 2010, the smog laws tightened up again, so you have a 2010 spec motor. And most of the manufacturers, in fact, all but one, put in a, t a separate little fuel tank, except it's not fuel, it's, it's DEF, diesel exhaust fluid. And your DEF tank typically holds 20 or 30 gallons, and you, you fill it from a separate pump, a separate nozzle at the pump, different stuff. It's, what's in there is called urea. It is kind of an artificial cousin to urine. Now, this does not mean that you can pee in the death tank if you run out of death. No, it's not the same as urine. Thankfully, it doesn't smell as bad, um, but it's chemically related. Ew. So anyway, you spray a little bit of that into the exhaust to further clean up emissions. Don't ask me exactly how it works, but that system actually caused less problems in most of these trucks than DPF, the, the diesel particulate filter caused more problems than death. One company, uh, international, actually owned by Navistar or some outfit, uh, decided, no, nah, we're not going to do death. We're not going to do this separate tank full of stuff that you got to pay $2.78 a gallon for. Um, no, what we're going to do is we're going to take the old exhaust gas recirculation system and we're going to super bump it up bigger, heavier, and do more exhaust gas recirculation, and we'll clean up our emissions that way. That was the International Max Force, and it was a disaster. Uh, Jay Cannell has a whole video on how Max Forces of that era, where it was a Max Force motor on an International, and it uh, did not have a DEF tank when it probably should have, up through, I think, 2013 or so, maybe 2014, I'm not sure. Um, those engines were a fiasco. By far the worst engines in trucking. Uh, my recommendation is avoid, first of all. If you can get an international with a Cummins, that's a different matter. We, we haven't covered the history of Cummins. We will in a second when we get to that. Uh, if you do have one of these Max Force um, 2010 forward, but no DEF exhaust fluid motors, you're, or you somebody offers you a screaming deal on one that looks really nice it's been recently rebuilt and it's only 20,000 bucks and it's got 300,000 miles on it you're like, man I really want that motor well wait here's what you do go on Google find something called the uh, what is it called it's the aftermarket EGR cooler Max Force EGR cooler it's about an $800 part that's not too difficult to install yourself, even with only minor mechanical chops. And it's a massively over-engineered, super-duty EGR gas cooler that radically helps those motors. The other thing to do with those Mac forces is make sure that a set of 2014 updates the International put on those motors are applied. Have an International dealer uh, run the serial number of the motor and truck and make sure those updates have been applied. If you do those two things, some people who seem to be credible online are saying you can live with one of those motors. Me, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I'd touch one, honestly. Uh, but they say you can live with it. We'll see. Um, I don't know too much about the later international motors after... Uh, well, especially after 2014 when they started actually putting DEF tanks on them. Uh, I'm told that the 2017s, they made some more changes yet, and they're getting really impressive fuel economy claims. How good those claims are? Look, if you're interested in a newer international for some reason, uh, and they're, other than the problems with those Max Force engines, International's got a reputation as a tough little honest truck. 
Uh, if you're interested in that, I recommend do your own research, do more research. Okay, we've talked. Let's go. Let's go follow the history of Cat for a moment again. Uh, Cat. I told you that the 3406E was the first of their electronic motors. Uh, around, I think it was 2000, they switched to the the first of the C15 motors, 15 liter, which is the same as the 3406 series. Um, the 3406, the, sorry, the C156NZ was very similar to a 3406E and has a wonderful reputation for toughness. It's easy to identify because it's got a single turbocharger. Both the 3406E, 3406B for that matter, and the C15 6NZ are single turbo cats. Somewhere, I believe 2002, they switched over to a twin turbo cat. It's got one turbo that then feeds another turbo. It's real complicated looking plumbing on the right side. If you look carefully, you can spot these twin turbo setups. They have less of a good reputation. The core engine internals are still okay. Uh, they don't spit cams or um, throw rods or anything like that. The, the, the core internals are fine, but there's problems with that twin turbo cam set. Sorry, twin turbo setup, not cam. There's um, strange references I'm seeing to changes in the wiring harness results in better fuel economy and power and everything gets your life gets suddenly better i don't understand how a change in the wiring harness would have that much of an effect but people are talking about this uh, if for some reason you are interested in a truck that has a c15 twin turbo do more research uh, look at the, the the electrical changes apparently exist uh, look at i've heard of single can uh, sorry single turbo conversions for those motors as well now, starting in 2007, when CAT tried to make motors that, uh, oh, by the way, also in the pre-2007 era, you see the CAT C12 and C13. I've heard a lot of good things about those motors. I wouldn't turn up my nose on them at all. I think some of those are actually twin turbo, but seem to work okay. Uh, it's a C15 twin turbo that people are scratching their heads over. Right. 2007 hits, and the DPF requirement goes in to use a particular filter and cat pukes all over themselves uh, the cat motors of that era 2007 8 9 terrible just a disaster and for a good long for many years cat completely abandoned the heavy truck oh, uh, highway use motor business because they weren't making trucks at all unlike for example, Detroit Diesels, Associated Freightline, and those guys making trucks. Cat's only making motors. Same with Cummins, actually. Uh, and Cat abandons that market because the those early smog, all the Cat motors, disaster. Avoid those at all costs. Don't go anywhere near them. I believe somewhere in 2012 or later, they started to come back to the market in at least a small scale, and supposedly those are okay. Um, but I would, if, if you're looking at a small equipped cat motor, uh, be very careful, do your research, okay? Cummins, we talked about the Cummins. Uh, big cam motor was their old mechanical engine. Their first electronic motor was the N14, wonderful engine. Then they went to the ISX. Well, the ISX, actually came in two flavors from up to 2010 they had the twin cam ISX that motor is not that good the ISX twin cam I'd avoid it too many reports of melting the cam loads lobes and you get up around six seven hundred eight hundred thousand miles on it the top end falls apart the whole top end needs a rebuild and other issues in 2010, at some point in 2010, they switched to a single cam ISX. That motor's a gem. 15 liter. Um, I'll give you an example. I have a friend who bought a 2014 um, International Lone Star. That's the best truck that International knows how to make. And it never came with a Max Force. It always came with a Cummins engine. A friend had a single cam Cummins with a 13-speed motor, 
it was the first ungoverned truck he'd ever run so he was running heavy loads across montana and other rural midwest states where there's high speed limits and he's running balls out he's running 75 80 miles an hour across some of these states and reporting 7.4 miles to the gallon fully loaded at those speeds holy crap that's not bad at all look your target at 65 miles an hour if you can possibly get eight miles to the gallon fully loaded average you're doing very good that's your target you need to be at at least seven miles per gallon if you can uh, even with an early 2000s truck that's possible if you pick if you do everything right if your gearing's correct if you've got a transmission with enough gears or no or if like a 10 speed with overdrive works pretty good and you get the right gears in the rear end and everything else is right about the truck it's got at least acceptable aerodynamics for its time uh, you can get seven you might be able to get eight uh, under the right circumstances. Um, one of the things I want to do with a truck I buy, and I'll be shopping for a pre-2007 truck, I've already decided. Um, and it's going to take very careful shopping. Um, and I'll, I'll get into that later. But I intend to get something like that and improve the aerodynamics to the, to the max that something of that era can possibly do. And I'm going to see what kind of mileage I can get and possibly do a website uh, reporting what mileage changes happen after a month with what mechanical change or you know, test something like uh, dynamic wheel balance, things like that, or new aerodynamics package modification. Uh, my ultimate goal is to start a website to discuss those changes. and. Somewhere around, somewhere around a year from now, I've got a good chance at scoring about 50000 bucks or a bit more uh, in my pocket and buying an older truck with one for about $20,000, put the other $30,000 in the bank uh, as my emergency uh, capitalization, and go. That's, that's honestly my plan right now if I can pull it off. Okay back to work let's go we've talked Volvo um, I mentioned the D13 uh, it's a good motor but they had problems with the small controls up until about 2012 2013 they finally got those sorted out I'm in a 2014 Volvo right this moment right? I mean as we speak uh, with a D13 in it and I would say it's an impressive motor strong uh, doesn't use a drop of oil. It's got almost 300,000 miles on the clock. I'm not using a drop of oil. Uh, internal motor quality is fantastic. Electrical gremlins. Ooh, that's the problem. And that's what hit Matt. And what I'm seeing, for example, is every once in a while, uh, my check engine light will stay on for a little bit, and then it'll go away. There's just no telling what's causing that. Uh, and that's unfortunately faint. Two, I was saying Volvo. Uh, the Volvos of the pre-2007 era, the D12 motor, uh, do not have such a reputation for electro electronic complexity. Now, Volvos do have another bad reputation. They are built as lightweight as they can possibly make them, and a lot of the body parts are somewhat flexible, and over time will develop cracks uh, and other weirdnesses. Uh, the body works just not that tough. Um, plastic and fiberglass of mediocre quality. So a Volvo that's been on the road, it's done hard use for eight years, you'll start to see things like guys got a bungee cord holding the hood down, stuff like that. Uh, that is part of Volvo's reputation as well. Now in 2000, Volvo bought Mac. Mac, of course, is an old school American truck line that had a reputation for extreme durability, and Volvo's kind of maintained that. Uh, up into the early 2000s, you still saw Mack motors in them. Uh, the the Mack 427 motor before 2007 has a wonderful reputation. I believe it's in the 13 liter class. Um, now, if you buy a Mack, you're still buying a steel-bodied, heavier, not quite as comfortable truck, slightly rougher to ride, tougher truck, 
that's got what's really a Volvo engine in it. They'll call it something else. They call it an MP8 motor or something like that. It's really, it's a, it's a Volvo D13 motor with slightly different um, software and state of tune, but it's really, it's a Volvo motor. Um, I don't know if the newer Volvo, sorry, the newer Max have the same reputation for electronic complexity as... <laughs> sorry about that. As a modern Volvo. Don't know. Um, I would check into that. Um, I'm just not sure about that one. Okay. One more thing about Volvo. The D16. Uh, Volvo has a heavy use massive torque 16 liter motor that from my conversations with drivers who have been behind it they say it is a turd and a half um, not reliable and not just uh, peripheral electronics parts but core internal engine stuff is just not right uh, my understanding is if you want a Volvo with a heavy haul hard use motor uh, get it with a Cummins 15 liter that, that works just fine. Uh, even if it's a twin cam Cummins, still worlds ahead of the D16, or the D16 at all costs. Uh, okay, we've covered so far international um, Freightliner family, which is Sterling Freightliner and Western Star, coped with the smog changes probably better than anybody else. Uh, they were at the they they were at the top of that game. And if you want a good, reliable, used truck, it's hard to go wrong, hard to go wrong with those guys. Uh, assuming that you have one that meets your needs. Um, if I'm, I'll really mention flatbedding just for a second. If I want a, if I'm flatbedding, I probably am making more per mile. I probably care less about aerodynamics because a lot of my loads are just bricks. Um, aerodynamics only so much you can do at that point um, I am probably going to look into a 14 to 15 meter class motor and I'm going to look at a truck that is tough enough for some off-roading uh, I definitely want to make sure I've got 6x4 drive trim which means i got a switch in the dashboard that can engage both rear drive axes and it's a very common feature on a truck I've not been in a truck without it so far but there are some uh, if you're flat bending, you absolutely have to have locker rears. Uh, to deal with that locker rear, when you hit that switch to engage both, better to be just stopped at that point. You can do it while you're gently rolling, but if you do it while a tire is spinning out, oh, I need more traction, I'm burning out, uh, I'm stuck in the mud, I'll hit the switch, you'll lunch the rear end. You'll spread parts everywhere. If you hit that switch with it burning out, don't ever do that. Okay, um, so... Flat betters absolutely have to have locker rears, double locker rears. Um, what else? They could probably use a 14, 15 liter class motor, although they can often get by with a 13. Um, and they probably don't want a Volvo because that flexible plastic bodywork is going to get beat up on any kind of a dirt road. Not, not recommended at all. Uh, in to Volvo's credit. They do have some of the best ride quality, uh, smoothest ride, and creature comforts, uh, and easy driving. Uh, the first truck I've ever been in that had self-canceling turn signals. This is 2014 Volvo 670 I'm in right now. Uh, so, creature comforts, yes. If you're taking your wife out on the road, maybe that's a good thing. Uh, the 780 has a wonderful 78-inch long sleeper compartment, one of the biggest in the industry. Now, let's switch our attention to the Kenworth uh, Peterbilt family. Kenworth and Peterbilt, both owned by the Packard Group and have been for a long time. Uh, up, especially up until about 2010, they always bought Detroit or Cummins or Cat Motors. So, all the conversation I've had about those, same. Okay? Uh, I don't think you're going to find one equipped with a Detroit motor from the DPF era forward. Uh, at that, by that time, Detroit, I believe, was focusing pretty much exclusively on motors for their own internal use. And that's, that's now still the case. I'm not seeing any of the trucks on the road 
with Detroit Motors uh, hardly ever if there if there exist at all. Uh, Kenworth Peterbilt owned by the Packard Group around 2010 2011 somewhere in there Packard starts importing their own motors from Europe the such as the MX-13 oh boy it's not quite a max force but it's not nice uh, I had a year's stick time behind a 2014 Kenworth T680 with uh, automatic transmission uh, and a MX-13 motor. Let me say I'm not at all pleased with the reliability of those MX-13s. Um, not only did I have one where the DPF filter clogged up and the thing actively tried to kill me with carbon monoxide emissions, uh, made worse by the fact that my sense of smell my nose is not very good. So I drove around in this truck for two weeks, um, breathing a lot of carbon dioxide, half stoned out of my mind. Brought my wife on board the truck and she immediately smelled, well you can't smell carbon monoxide, but you can smell the diesel odor comes in with it. And she said, damn, something's not right about this. We get it checked out. Oh yeah, it needed a whole bunch of work. Okay, DPF filter clogged. Um, so that truck tried to kill me. I'm not happy about that. I talked to a uh, Kenworth dealer in Miami, Florida, uh, one of their techs, told me that of a 2014 Kenworth with an MX-13 engine, 75% of the repairs coming in, the warranty repairs, had to do with the smog systems. Now this is in 2014 when most of these guys are supposed to have gotten the smog situation changes from 20, 2007 to 2010 under some kind of control. Well, uh, not really. Um, would I buy one of those with a Cummins um, single cam motor? Yeah. Oh yeah. Because that's the only real problem with, uh, with those engines. Um, I'm just going to tell you, very disappointing what's been going on in this industry with some of these trucks. Very disappointing. Um, other than that, Kenworth's reputation is for uh, a very, Kenworth and, Pat, and Peterbilt both, reputation for a very decent, good quality truck with good wiring, um, good creature comforts, um, both of them superior to a Freightliner, for example, uh, is the reputation. The, oh, head bump. Uh, the very best um, Freightliners aren't that bad, though. Uh, and nine minutes on the second part all right let's talk briefly about modifications uh, if you're trying to improve the ride quality there's a couple things you can do a couple companies have aftermarket bolt-on front airbag assist systems so you've got a spring front suspension with a shock absorber of course uh, but you put in a secondary airbag with a dial adjustable um, pressure gauge uh, pressure controller on those airbags to fine-tune your ride quality up front um, yeah that can work real well I've heard good things about those systems Bose the, the speaker and music supply company uh, BOSE makes truck seats of all things well yeah they make truck seats they have one that runs about thirty five hundred dollars ah, that actively electronically damps the ride so it detects the bump and it moves itself to compensate for the bump if the truck's rising it'll drop you to match the rising speed of the truck so the truck could be going over a series of nasty potholes in Manhattan Going, butter, 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 and the seat's going, Bing. it's been, yeah, that's what you get for 3500 Well, three weeks ago at a Kenworth dealer in Indiana, I was told that another company is about to ship a clone of the Bose system seat with that kind of active damping for under $2,000. Hmm. Now, at that rate, uh, especially if I bought an older truck with the seats shot anyway, 
uh, I might very well bolt one of those into the passenger seat for my wife. My wife rides with me a lot. We like being out on the road together, although she doesn't drive. Uh, a heavy truck, I should say. She drives a car, it's fine. Um, but she has back problems. She had uh, neck surgery um, three years ago, uh, shortly after I married her. Um, funny thing about that, I, I, yeah, boy. I've introduced myself in this video as Jim Simpson, and that is what's on all my ID that I am Jim Simpson after my name changed because when I married my wife in late 2013, uh, November of 2013, November 17th, I forget that, my wife will get, ah, all right, great gal though. Uh, I took her last name, which has worked out great except for one thing I didn't realize at first, that meant I would end up being a guy with a maiden name. Anyway, uh, you'll find a lot of references to to me at, on YouTube and in my Google accounts and on Reddit and places like that as Jim March. I'm Jim March. Before I was Jim Simpson. Now I'm Jim Simpson. Okay. Confusing, I know. Hey, let's have another uh, celebrity showed up. Mmm, uh, trucker I am. Mmm, 410, buddy good. Yeah, uh, Yoda didn't work out very well as a trucker. The first problem is nobody could understand the little green booger. Second problem is somebody told him to float the gears and they found him out in the parking lot with his truck stranding pulled out and he's hovering it eight feet in the air going, Mmm, pointless this is. Mmm, working this is not. The mechanic comes rushing out of the yard going, Oh man, no, not like that, you little green booger. Put that tranny back in there. And of course the third problem with Yoda as a trucker is he's driving down the street with some guy's hand shoved up his butt. Man. Can't have that. I mean, even if that's your thing, that's fine, but not wall driving. Okay, so, so Yoda didn't work out as a trucker. <sighs> Have I covered pretty much everything here? Um, yeah, let's go into one more thing. How many miles has a truck got? <laughs> All right, uh, brand new truck's supposed to have, well, like zero miles or, you know, no more than three, four digits max of miles, and it still uh, can be sold brand new. Okay, fine. Um, when a big company gets a hold of a truck, me the so-called mega carriers, they pretty much always sell them at 500,000 miles. Why? Because that's when the warranty runs out. So there's a lot of used trucks out there that have 500,000 miles on them. Well, if I was shopping for a truck like that, and that's typically about, in today's market, about a $50,000, $60,000 truck, I would want to know what company it came from. And then I would ask myself a really serious question. Does that company it came from hire brand new drivers? Uh, CRST, CR England, uh, Swift, these guys, these guys are just <sighs> exploiting brand new truckers. Often creating brand new truckers and then exploiting the crap out of them. And those trucks have seen just a succession of newbies. Would I own one if I could avoid it. Uh, I, I hope not. Um, with, my, with my luck, personally, or somebody like Matt's luck, little guy trucker, you get a truck that was owned by a trainer for one of those companies. So he's had a succession of greenhorns in his truck, spending half the time driving it. And I can't even imagine how beat up one of those would be. Holy mackerel. But you know, even that aside, you know, I would rather have a truck that came out of a fleet where they generally hire experienced drivers only, if I could possibly avoid it. Uh, but, um, on the other hand, if a test drive shows that it runs good and the training seems solid, it's not loose as a goose, it flicks into gear, you know, pretty rationally. Uh, I might go for a truck of that sort. And um, older than that, into the, the trucks with 700,000 miles or more, boy, real mixed bag. Um, trucking exec is uh, well known in YouTube trucking circles by now. Um, I don't know if he's not well known, he should be at least somewhat known. Good guy. He runs a trucking company as opposed to being a driver. He said something important about the business aspects of trucking. As a guy who owns a truck, 
talking to us, which is not me yet, by the way. I'm going to buy a truck. I don't have one. Yeah, this is a company truck. Um, he's telling us that we have an advantage that we can control all the business aspects of our one truck business and control exactly what that truck does for maximum profit and in that way compete with the bigger guys. He's absolutely right. I think that you can apply that same thinking to the process of buying one truck for you and controlling as many of the variables as you possibly can. Uh, you, when you buy a used truck, you should be taking a sample of that oil and sending it into a lab and seeing how much metal crap and such is in it. Uh, you might also want to have them pull one of the oil filters off, spin it off, look at it, squeeze out the mesh and see how much metal residue is in there. Not much metal residue, that's a good sign. Metal shavings, not a good sign. Uh, you should be looking over the truck in extreme detail, but more importantly, ask where the thing has been. Whose truck was that? Often some of your, the best deals you can possibly find was on something that was owned by an owner operator like you want to be. Um, and the guy is retiring. Boy, if you can find one of those, and you don't actually see those on trucktrader.com so much or you know the, the used truck papers and all the truck stops you find those on craigslist um, think about that for a moment uh, those little individual buyers you want to buy a truck that's been well loved and well taken care of by somebody with good maintenance records and you know where it came from before he had it you know the truck's history there are some gems out there in the 20 grand range I'm convinced of it. From all the research and shopping I've done, I, I think there's some gems. But, uh, there's lemons as well. And that's why I don't, if you've only got $20,000 to spend on a used truck and you want to go be an owner operator, god damn son, that is the riskiest play you can move, in, you can make in trucking, right? There. Uh, you get one turbo blowout or that uh, top end needs overhauled or something like that, you're out of business. You're done. Okay? That $20,000 investment, you know, you're lucky to get five grand in truck parts back out of it. You're, you're just done. And you go back to driving as a company driver. Uh, minus 15 grand or more in it. On the other hand, if you have some capitalization over and above the cost of that truck, Especially if you have capitalization to buy a carefully picked out used truck and you put some initial work into it and you're still capitalized. Like you walk in with 50 grand and that's practical, something like that. Uh, and you might make it. And there's, at that point, with no truck payment at all in the right gig, there's money there. I think there's money there. Um, could I be wrong? Oh, absolutely, I could be wrong. Oh, yes. I've been do I've been driving now for two and a quarter years. I have seen some stuff, but do I know everything? Oh, heck no. No, 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 no. But I've swallowed a lot of information. I hope uh, some of what I've dumped on you has been valuable. And oh, ha ha! I almost forgot. What do you call a truck? That's partially used, partially new. What? Yeah, those exist. It's called a glider kit. We got to talk about a glider kit. Glider kit's a legal loophole in the federal smog laws. No joke. You order a brand new truck from Freightliner. Does most of these, but I think some are Peterbilt's as well. Brand new truck. It's got no engine. What? Yeah, no engine. It's also got no rear axles. So. They tow it to the dealer, I guess, backwards on the front axles. And some dealer who's also building lighter kits buys an older pre-smog truck, pre-2007, that has an engine that's worth rebuilding and it has rear axles that are worth rebuilding. Pulls that engine, rear axles, rebuilds them, puts them in the brand new truck, destroys the older truck, and now you're 
new truck with some rebuild parts legally becomes the old truck and doesn't have to match modern smog laws. That's a glider kit. Um, are those worth looking at? Yeah. If I was going to buy a brand new truck, I would seriously consider a glider kit. What's the downside? Well, just like owning a truck prior to 2007, or put another way, a pre-DPF truck, you are not allowed to take that truck to California. California requires you to have at least 2007 spec emissions controls on that truck. And if you enter California without them, and I don't mean just if they're pulled off, I mean if, even if it's an older truck, you're not allowed to take that truck into California. Or if it's a glider kit, you can't go into California. If you own such an older truck or glider kit truck, well, obviously one downside is you can't go to California. And by the way, in 2023, they're going to up the ante, and now you can't bring any truck older than 2010 spec. So you not only have to have the DPF, this particular filter, you need that DEF, or you're risking everything on a max force, which didn't have it. Okay, fine. Um, you have 2010 spec truck required to go into California. There's been worry for several years now that other states would, would start to copy California's rules on this. It hasn't happened yet, thank God, okay? It's still a problem because one-ninth of every U.S. citizen or person living in America, legally, I guess, it's hard to count the other kind, but one-ninth of every person living in America lives in California. That's how big that state is. So you're excluding yourself from that market. But it's an annoying market because uh, the truck stops are always full. There's all kinds of extra BS regulations. There's a um, 55 mile an hour truck speed limit across the whole state. Oh, that's not good for the paycheck. Uh, so maybe you want to avoid California regardless. A lot of people are making the decision to stay with a uh, glider kit or pre-2007 to avoid the emissions drama that I've been talking about. Uh, my view is if you want a lower cost used truck and you do want to go into California at least until 2013, um, or sorry, 2023, excuse me, then your best bet is probably Freightliner for pre-2012. After 2012, your options open up some more. Um, but I would still avoid Packard Motors in the uh, Peterbilt Kenworth family. Uh, I would avoid uh, the Volvo D16. I would avoid the, uh, we mentioned these twin cam uh, Cummins. Or I wouldn't say they're huge lemons, but they're not as good as some of the other choices. Um, that's about it. That's about the most of the data dump I've got for you. And God, we're almost two hours, we're almost an hour long into this. Uh, camera cut out from the first section at 33 minutes. But I hope it helped. I hope it helped somebody. And I'm going to continue looking for other states that have lemon law language. Oh! There's a, haha, <laughs> glad one more thing. You just saw me turn my Jake on in this uh, Volvo, and it's a very quiet Jake. One of, the, <laughs> one of the differences between newer and older trucks is starting around 2000, between 2008 and 2010, uh, a lot of these truck firms started to put big mufflers on the Jakes. Um, and I'm using that generically, the engine braking systems, uh, whatever you want to call them. Uh, they put big mufflers on them. The old school, like anything with an N14 or um, maybe those, the big cat C15, 6NZ, you put those jakes on it's raw, like raw kind of noise. Um, and some residential areas take a very dim view of this. Um, but with this, with this uh, newer Volvo, I can run the jakes. And you're you might be able to hear that some you might not i don't know so uh, does your truck have a uh, jake muffler on it uh, quiet jake or older school roaring jake 
Some people like the raw NJ guys badly. Anyway, uh, so that's another thing to consider. And talking about it just because I happen to hit the jigs on a long downhill run. Um, I'm only loaded with like 10,000 pounds of exercise equipment right now, so. Uh, jigs don't matter too much to me right this moment. Uh, that's about it. I'll sign off, but hope it's been enjoyable and at least somewhat entertaining. And yes, I drive dispatchers somewhat out of their minds. Part of my hobby. Everybody's got to have a hobby. Thank you for listening. I want to... This is part three of what's probably going to turn into an hour-long podcast. And I want to first make a correction to something I said earlier in this same podcast. I'm going to splice the three parts in together later. Um, I said that any truck older than 2002 was going to escape the e-log requirements. That's not the case. It turns out it's going to be older than the 2000 model year. Sorry about that. Uh, and there's some controversy over that, by the way, because you can have a truck that is 2000 model year, uh, but it was made in late 99, or mid-99, I guess, in some cases, and it is still going to fall under the e-log requirement. So it goes by model year, not year of manufacture, as best people can tell. Um, however, um, there's some controversy over how the law is actually written and whether or not that's the case. So people are still wrangling about that. But to be absolutely sure, you want 99 model year or older if you're trying to escape e-log. A glider kit, by the way, will not help you escape the e-log mandate. Um, it will escape um, most of the smog law requirements, especially the 2007 and 2010 spec. It doesn't help with e-logs. Okay, let's try to recap what all this information means about older trucks and escaping e-log requirements, and especially escaping the various types of smog law requirements, and which trucks work best from what years, and et cetera, et cetera. So we've, that's what we've been discussing. I spent seven months working for a company that tried to keep a fleet together of 2002 to 2006 trucks, and this is in 2016. Um, they're trying to run older trucks that are pre-2007 smog. Um, some of them were gliders, but a lot of them were just plain old trucks with over a million miles on them. And I can tell you, it didn't work out very well. They did some things right. They standardized on freight liners with the 12.7 Detroit Diesel Series 60 motor, which is a good choice, good set of choices right there. But trucks that old have to be very carefully picked out, okay? You have to really hand inspect very carefully what you're buying. And when they were trying to run a fleet of a bit over 200 of these things, um, to do it right, they would have had to put just as much resources into buying old trucks, finding them, moving them to home base, repainting them you know, their own colors and, and labels, and getting them on the road as they spend on recruiting new drivers. And if you've been around this industry a lot, you know that driver recruitment is just a huge issue that they spend a lot of time on with dedicated professionals. They would have had to put the same kind of resources into picking trucks out, and they didn't. And as a result, the trucks were very often breaking, um, just not reliable. Drivers were frustrated with how often they were breaking. Uh, I know I was, and I talked to a lot of other drivers for that company. I'm not going to name who they are. Um, not here to embarrass somebody, but I'm just saying I've seen an effort to make it work that didn't work. Now, this gets back to where we started earlier, much earlier in this podcast, I said, trucker exec says that an individual truck owner on the road has an advantage in that he can carefully manage his business for his needs. And I believe we can extend that to saying that the guy buying an older truck can very, very carefully pick out an older truck. And let's give some tips for that. All right. I've given you some ideas about what to buy. Now let's talk about how. Um, if I was shopping for something that was a pre-smog truck and I didn't want to make payments on a glider kit, which is certainly another option, by the way, but if I'm trying to buy a 
2003 or even a pre-2000 trying to escape e-logs, uh, I want to very, very carefully pick out that truck. And I think specifically what I want to look for is modifications that are not corporate looking, that some individual owner operator did. I want a truck that was last owned by an individual owner operator cowboy who took perfect care of the thing during the time he had it, which was probably somewhere after the 500,000 mile mark, about when they get sold from corporate fleets. We've talked about that. Um, I want to see maybe weird stuff like um, changes to the interior layout, um, weird hood ornaments, um, extra lights, uh, maybe odd paint jobs that maybe I don't even like that paint job and it's something custom and weird, but I can, I can repaint a truck for fairly cheap. I mean, yeah, three grand, worst case, four, somewhere in there. But if I know that the thing's been very carefully taken care of, and I've got, and the other thing to look for, of course, is good repair records. I want to see when the transmission was last rebuilt, when the engine was last rebuilt, how old are the turbos, all that stuff. I want to see records and receipts. If I see that, and I see an older truck that was clearly loved and maybe i need to find something like that on craigslist not a used truck dealer okay maybe i need to actually talk to a retiring owner operator who's getting out of the business and selling his pride and joy maybe that's exactly what i need and maybe i want to look you know not just in my state but several other states away i mean maybe i want to look very carefully over a big distance to find exactly such a critter now and by the way if we're talking about a truck that's got 800,000 miles or more unless there's something really special about it it's a 15 to 20 thousand dollar truck somewhere around there okay uh, less than that if it's in somewhat crappy shape but I probably want to avoid that all right let's talk about what your options are when you're buying a truck you you let's say for example somebody drops fifty thousand dollars into your lap and that could actually happen to me in about a year from a lawsuit long story i'm not going to go there but you got fifty thousand dollars in handle and you want to be an owner operator what are your choices well if your credit is even halfway reasonable uh, simply going to a truck dealer and buying a new truck is certainly an option on the table and your down payment may be something in the ten twenty thousand dollar range maybe thirty thousand but that's okay and then you make payments on it of a thousand fifteen hundred a month well that's not bad either um a lot of people are out here doing lease op arrangements paying 800 bucks a week for their truck um if you're paying that only every other week you're certainly in better shape than them and you've got a brand new truck um and we're talking about a truck worth between 120 and 150 thousand dollars and if you do that route um uh, with a brand new warranty head to, nose to toes um go to wisconsin definitely um it'd be the first thing i'd do because i've got um better warranty protections um under something called the lemon law which specifically applies to used heavy trucks in Wisconsin. Most of the states doesn't apply. Okay, what's in plan B? Well, get a truck that just came off of a uh, large corporate lease. And these things are worth between thirty-five and $55,000, roughly. And they got about half a million miles on them. And these can be a very good deal. There's um, dealers out there that are reputable that offer uh, a good warranty, comes with it, uh, for say a couple of years. You can, if you have even poor credit, you can pay between six to nine grand down payment. And now of your $50,000, you still have, call it 40,000 in the kitty. Um, you're pretty well capitalized for something major breaking and taking a little bit, a little bit of time to fix. Um, 
you're in pretty good shape. That's not a bad way to go. Um, another choice that's between those two extremes, uh, no, they're not extremes, excuse me, between those two points, let's say, is you buy a brand new glider kit. Now, a glider kit truck, remember, it's a brand new truck from nose to rear end, but it's got rebuilt axles and it's got a rebuilt engine. And it only needs to meet, um, at best, at, at worst, it needs to meet 2002 smog spec. But you're dodging all the problems with the diesel particulate filter and um, diesel exhaust fluid. All those issues from 20, 2007, 2010, they're gone. And you, can, uh, you cannot take that truck into California. Right. So, that's a perfectly reasonable alternative, too. If you, if you go with the um, 500,000 mile used truck, you can very often get one of those that has um, California legality. Uh, a 2012, 2013, 2014, those are available in that kind of price range. 40, 50K, give or take a little on each side. Um, now you've got a California legal truck, by the way. Um, that's probably the cheapest way you can get a California legal truck. Your next alternative is the so-called ghetto truck. Oh, by the way, the, let's one more thing on, on a 500,000 mile class truck, and it'll be a little bit above and below that, but that kind of number is pretty common because that's when large companies get rid of the trucks. Um, get into something like that, and um, you can still pick out a reliable one pretty easily. Uh, you can get a couple of years worth of warranty. Um, And even if you have bad credit, you can get into something like that. And by the way, you're paying, this is the point I've missed. You're going to pay less than uh, $1,000 a month for something like that. Okay? Not bad. Not a bad deal. Not a bad way to go. The final way to go of the four we've mentioned now, including gliders, including new, including 500,000 mile, is the so-called ghetto truck. Your 800,000 mile and above older truck. If you're going to do that, you've got $50,000 cash in hand now. You buy a truck for $20,000, and you put maybe $5,000 worth of immediate um, upgrades uh, for comfort, for cosmetics, for issues that it might have in. Um, you can roll on that. You better have at least $20,000 in the bank capitalization in case of breakdown. Um, if you only have $20,000 to spend to get into the owner-op biz and you buy a ghetto truck for fifteen dollars to $20,000 range and that's it and you're going to go off and do your big adventure, you're an idiot. I'm just going to tell you right now that's dumb because you have no reserves for a breakdown one blown tranny somewhere in the middle of nowhere with an expensive tow bill back to where it can be fixed and you're done you're dead okay you'll end up abandoning it there or selling it for scrap to whoever will pick it up you're you're, you're done you go back to driving a company truck somewhere so you have to be capitalized for that one big time um what's the advantage of that plan well there's some risk that it'll break down, but if you're capitalized, you can manage that risk. You're not going to be able to get a warranty on a ghetto truck, most likely. Um, you can on a 500,000 mile special, not on a ghetto truck. But what's your advantage? Well, you own the pink, you have two advantages. You own the pink, the title, outright. You have no weekly, monthly, whatever truck payment. You own the turkey. So, if you want to park it for a week or a month, while your wife has, sur wife has surgery or want to go take a vacation or something like that, cool, no problem. That's not a bad thing. Other advantage is that you can modify that truck. You can change the seats. You can put in um, whatever unusual secondary air conditioning system you want. This, that's probably something I should do another podcast on. So I've built complete off-grid power systems um, how to do an APU right is an interesting subject. So you can do things like, things like that. Um, 
you can completely gut the interior behind and instead of cabinets and a narrow bed put in a queen size bed right behind the front seats and keep all of your your fridge and shelves and all that on what was the upper bunk so the whole bottom of the rear area is one big queen bed for you and your wife pretty awesome if you own the pink outright you can do that if you're making payments on it you cannot you don't even think about it not until you own it outright so that's something to think about so these are some of the options you have and i hope i've equipped you to make a decision like that thanks for listening